Hi everyone and welcome to the next video in our mini lecture series on the Koopman operator. And this one is going to be about data and how to learn the Koopman operator from measurements using finite dimensional approximations of the function space. What we have seen until now was always the case where we have a nonlinear system where we map forward in time the state xk by a nonlinear flow map, which gives us xk plus one. And the Koopman operator is now the linear operator that does not act on the state space, but it acts on the space of these observable functions, right? So general space F or L2 in previous videos. So what it does is it's a linear operator that if we compose it with the flow, really gives us a linear advancement in time of this observable function. And so we trade nonlinearity on the state space by linearity in an infinite dimensional function space. And so the goal that we need to follow here is, is to find an n dimensional approximation. Right, which means we are not interested in all possible functions, but in a subset of functions that can be expressed by n basis functions. And this n can become very large, but still this allows us to get away from functions and work with finite dimensional systems, namely the basis coefficients of these basis functions. And this is the what's called Galerkin approximation and all of the final element techniques, for instance, for partial differential equations work with this concept as well. And so the idea is to introduce a finite dimensional approximation. So we are not considering all size, but only those who can be expressed in the form of this series expansion, ak times psi k of x. Or if we write it in vector form, right, I'm going to use this psi with the bars for this, times the vector, what we get is something like psi one of x, psi n of x. So we do get a row vector of our measurements, so evaluation of the basis functions. And then we multiply this with the coefficient vector and we get a subspace, okay? So obviously we lose some of the right, generality because this is now not any function, but only functions that can be expressed in this basis, right? Could be these Hermit polynomials that we have seen before, could be Fourier, most of sines and cosines, any sort of basis you can think of. Polynomials are also very popular radial basis functions, so this is really limited only by your imagination. So now we have introduced this, and what we can do now is we can you know, use the rule for our Koopman operator to see what happens with the dynamics of this particular function. However, what we need to consider is that our psi now is not an element of this function space anymore, but it's the element of a subspace Fn. Okay, so an n-dimensional subspace that is precisely spanned by these n basis functions. And this is where complications arise and where certainly where people get run into difficulties when thinking about of this as a simple linearization technique. Right? So it's more than a linearization technique, it really has roots in function approximation and we need to be aware that a simple linearization really has limitations that need to be studied and hopefully quantified. Okay, but before we go there, let's simply use the definition of our Koopman operators. Okay, so k psi of x is psi of f of x And if you look at the definition now, this psi, if we express it in our basis, then it's simply, you know, plugging in the basis functions and then multiplying with this coefficient vector. So what we get is this psi basis function vector, and evaluated f of x, 
multiplied with these basis coefficients. And now the action of the Koopman operator propagates forward in time this function, like this. But because it's um, a set of basis functions, the only thing we can do is modify the basis coefficients. So what we get is the same basis coefficients at the previous time step and then a k matrix now because it acts on a vector of coefficients that maps this forward in time. And so what we have seen now is this is a discrete uh, in, in space discretized version of the Koopman operator. It's an n by n matrix. However, we cannot simply proceed like this because there is also a residual term. Why? Because it's not necessarily clear that if we consider an expression at time step k, let's say, in terms of this basis, that the function that we produce is also an element of this linear subspace. Okay? So what could happen is we have a function that can be expressed rather well in terms of this basis expansion, but at the next time we cannot. Okay? This would only remain valid if we had a so-called Koopman invariant subspace, which means that functions that ex are expressed in this basis remain expressible in this basis without any loss of accuracy. But oftentimes this is not the case. If we choose eigenfunctions, then we have this exact correspondence and this residual term would be zero. However, eigenfunctions are not known if we do not know the Koopman operator. Right? So this term really has to be addressed by the question whether the observable function we produce is also an element of this subspace that is defined by our basis functions. In general, it's not. And so here is where data comes into play, very similar to other well, data-driven techniques for system identification. Okay, so what we could say now is given trajectory data, so tuples x and f of x, so consecutive time steps, we would like to find the matrix that gives us the best mapping between this one and this expression. And so what we see is that this is really a, a form of minimizing this residual. And we can do so by solving a minimization problem. A standard least squares problem. Okay, So minimize over our data set, which can be now m samples or m tuples x and f of x. So what we want to minimize is this residual at all our samples and then the squared loss. So if you look at it like this, standard least squares regression and we can now plug in the definition of our residual would be we would be this expression minus this expression, okay? So we simply get minimize and now the optimization variable becomes the space of all n by n matrices for which we have this loss function k equal to 1 until m. And now the difference between psi of f of x times a and psi of x times k times a. So I can now take out the a and what I get is psi of f of x k minus psi of x k times the k matrix. And now both multiplied by this coefficient vector. But since this has to hold for any coefficient vector, we can in the end neglect it from our minimization problem. So what you see here is a standard linear regression formulation, right? So you have psi of f of xk minus psi of xk. So what we need is consecutive time steps and we do not need to know the f. If we have time step x and xk plus one, we can simply replace this by xk plus one. Okay, so here this has to be our basis function vector again. 
And so you see, in fact, this is a really nice standard linear regression problem and we can approximate the Koopman operator from data. What remains an open question is, one, how do we solve this problem in an efficient manner? This is what we're going to cover next. And this question of error and approximation accuracy is very, very active in, in research still. So before concluding, let's study a small example and then we are going to discuss solving this problem in the next video. So what we see here is um, the well-known duffing system where we have a second order ODE or a two-dimensional ODE in, um, with, of first order. So simple nonlinear oscillator, very widely studied in, in dynamic systems. And the first block is nothing but a Runge-Kutta integration scheme that gives us a trajectory of finite time steps. So this is basically our flow map F and gives us a trajectory of discrete time steps so that we can generate data. And before we do so, we can visualize what the system actually does. Okay, so you see here these red axes in the middle and one here at minus one, uh, one and one here are our fixed points. So plugging these into the right hand sides gives us stationary solutions. And then we have this behavior that these trajectories spiral around these fixed points. And in fact, what one can see, we will study this in the next videos, one can separate the state space into two basins of attraction because the, the, the left and right eigenvalues are stable so that the systems, as you see in the trajectory, spiral into these fixed points. Okay, but we, what we can do now is we can collect data. And this is actually very similar to, to what we know from other data-driven techniques for dynamic systems. We collect data, this is our x is the time steps um, xk here, and the y matrix is our time steps f of xk. So this one mapped forward in time by one time step. And from now on, we do not, do not need to assume that we know the system. We just need these X and Y matrices. So we have 2000 trajectories um, with certain time step that is, you know, 0 0.01 seconds is the runge kutta time step, but 0.25 time instances is the, the, the delta T between time steps. And then we have 10 iterations per trajectory and 2000 trajectories, so quite a rich data set which is visualized in the following. So you see that we have actually 2,000 trajectories of 11 points each, so initial condition plus 10 times ahead in time. So 20,000 tuples X and Y in uh, combination, okay? And so this is the basis for what we can now use for learning the, the, the Koopman operator. And what we need to do is we need to set up a dictionary, okay? So one can do different things. In, in this code example, you can find uh, Hermit polynomials, which we are going to use now. We can also find regular basis functions or the thin, thin plate, uh, thin plate splines to to uh, sort of you know exponential functions, um, which we will use later for for the eigenfunction computation. And then we define Hermit polynomials of maximum degree seven, and look at it like this. So we have seen these in another video before. These are now our basis functions. Um, constant function and so this is, you know, we're building up our dictionary out of these. And so this is the example for 1D. One can simply create 2D by taking, you know, products of these individual basis functions in, in two dimensions. So these Psi of X1 multiplied by Psi of X2 and this gives you in total 36, I think, roughly um, basis functions. So this capital N would be 36. All right, and now you can plug this into your algorithm and then perform EDMD. So you know, how we specifically implement this and visualize this, the, the details do not matter for this purpose here. What we get is this code where we have Psi X is simply lifting the X matrix. Right? This is our Psi of XK in my, my description here. And Psi Y is the Psi of F of XK, so the next time step. And then the Koopman operator is simply computed like this. I'm going to discuss in the next video how we get this specific matrix. Um, but this is how you get a N by N matrix and the details are going to be discussed in the next video. So thanks a lot until now and see you in part two.